العالمين وصلي وسلم على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقره اعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه افضل الصلاه واتم التسليم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار As always we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator sustainer nourisher protector and curer May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family members his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of qiyamah O slaves of Allah I advise myself firstly and then all of you all to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the numerous bounties and favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conferred upon us. The bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so numerous that if any one of us were to try and count these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would fail miserably. We would fail miserably because we are wallowing in an ocean of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this beautiful opportunity that he has blessed me to be amidst all of you all in this beautiful country of the Maldives. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in accordance to the words of my beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is reported to have said that the one who does not thank people, he has not thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I thank the organizers of this event and I also pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them in this world and the, the akhirah immensely. And I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah the Almighty makes this gathering a gathering where the malaika shroud us with their wings the sakina tranquility of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon us and the rahma of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelops us and may he the almighty make high mention of us in the seven heavens and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us more and more opportunities to meet one another in sessions of this nature and may he the almighty make us benefit and make these gatherings a source of benefit for us in this world as well as the akhirah i mean the topic for today's talk inshallah ta'ala is the magical bond of marriage we were talking about the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so many blessings and from these great blessings my dear respected elders brothers and sisters in islam is this blessing of nikah allahu akbar our powerful maker He says in the Noble Quran, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ It is from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is from His signs, His ayat, أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ That He has created for you all, from amongst you all, azwaja. partners spouses mates for what reason li litaskunu ilaiha so that you all may find tranquility by them allahu akbar wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahma and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has placed between you all mawadda and rahma we'll discuss these two terminologies as we go inshallah ta'ala inna fi dhalika la ayatin li qaumin yatafakkarun Indeed, in all of this, in all of this are signs for the nation that can think, that can ponder. Allahu Akbar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Him saying that these are from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indicates that these are all the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if Allah the Almighty, if He had wanted, He could have created us in such a manner that we would have no need towards a mate. 
towards a partner. Allah the Almighty could have created us in a way that we, could have, we would have reproduced individually, like some organisms, some bacteria, some amoeba do. But on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His infinite wisdom and out of His infinite mercy, He created us in such a manner that we are in need towards a partner. Allahu Akbar. You look at the animal kingdom, you look at the humans, you look at the jinnat, they are all created in pairs. This is from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nikah is indeed a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at our father, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah the Almighty created him. And it was as if Adam alayhi salatu wasalam was not co fully complete in Jannah without his spouse. Or until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Hawa, our mother Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam for Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. For him to, it was as if for him to even enjoy Jannah completely, he needed his partner beside him. Allahu Akbar. So my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, marriage is a magical bond that has been sealed off in the heavens. It was decreed long time back. And who was the matchmaker? The matchmaker was none other than our powerful maker, Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahu Akbar. And we also have to understand that nikah is an ibadah. Marriage is an ibadah. This beautiful bond of nikah is an ibadah in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith is in mustadrak of Imam Hakim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Man razaqahu Allahu ra'atan saliha, as for the individual who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with a pious, righteous woman as a wife, فَقَدْ أَعَانَهُ عَلَىٰ شَطْرِ دِينِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped him in regard to half of his deen. Allahu Akbar. With nikah, half of your deen is secured. And what about the other half? فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي الشَّطْرِ الْبَاقِي Let him adopt taqwa. Let him fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let him be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the remaining half. And in regard to this hadith, Imam al-Albani rahimahullah, he has brought it in his book, As-Sahih wa Targhib, and he has said in regard to the hadith that it is Hassan. Now in regard to the explanation of this hadith, scholars say that a pious wife, a pious wife will help you secure half of your deen. By you entering into a beautiful bond of nikah, a pious wife will help you secure half of your deen. And for the, she will help you secure half of your deen, and she will also help you secure the other half by helping you to bring taqwa. For if you are out of the bond of marriage, say you are not married, the devil plays with you in such a way that there are more chances that you may fall into zina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Because in regard to zina, we know how severe the prohibition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah the Almighty, He says in the Noble Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a powerful maker, He did not say in the Noble Quran, do not commit zina directly. Nay, rather look at the usage of the words. He, the Almighty, He has decreed, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا Do not even think of getting close to zina even. Allah. Leave alone the act of fornication, the act of adultery. Don't even think of getting close to zina. Scholars of tafsir, they mention that whatever little, little sins that gradually bring you close to zina, even those sins you must stay away from. And there are also some things that are, you know, a bit grey. You really can't place your finger on it. You really can't say it is haram. This afternoon I delivered a talk in one of the schools. I even mentioned it there. Say for example, Facebook. Being on Facebook. Now if you were to ask a scholar, 
can you give us a direct verdict whether Facebook is halal or haram? It's a bit difficult to give you a direct verdict whether it is halal or haram because it can be used for good purposes. If your intentions are proper, you can use Facebook for good purposes. If you're using it to promote the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will indeed be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But say if your intentions are bad, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Say if your intentions are perhaps to meet somebody from the opposite gender, which is haram, now you are opening an avenue towards zina, and that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits in the Noble Quran. Wala taqrabu zina. If that is your intention, if you feel weak, if you feel that the minute you log on to Facebook, you are gradually headed towards zina, shaitan is playing with your mind, you want to keep in touch with the opposite gender, you want to like her or his posts, pictures, comment, and try to build a relationship, a haram, illicit relationship, then completely stay away, deactivate your Facebook account. But on the other hand, if you are using Facebook, Twitter, any of these social media platforms to promote the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or perhaps you're doing it to advertise your business, something that is halal, then there is no issue. So, wala taqrabu zina. Do not even think of getting close to zina and by entering into a halal bond of nikah, you save yourself from zina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from zina. And that pious woman, that wife of yours will help you secure the other half, which is taqwa. Now let me tell you all a story. This story is mentioned in the books of Tariq. It is about one of our Salaf and Asali. His name was Thabit. His name was Thabit. He was a student of knowledge. He was a student of knowledge. And unlike our times, in those days, students of knowledge they had to travel from city to city, meeting scholar after scholar, obtaining knowledge. Today, mashallah, Allah the Almighty has facilitated things so much for us. We can seek knowledge from the, from the comfort of our own rooms in our own homes. Allahu Akbar. But in those days, they had to travel from city to city. And generally, those students of knowledge, they had no proper source of income. You understand? They had to travel from city to city. So this student... He was traveling from city to city of, uh, seeking knowledge. Now one day he was very, very hungry. Now like I said, they are generally not very well off financially. So he was very hungry and he was passing by an orchard. And he saw this overhanging branch which was hanging out of the orchard. And there was a juicy red apple hanging. Now he, hunger, pangs of hunger. He looked at the apple, hunger clouded his judgment, even though he was a student of knowledge, he was so hungry, he plucked the apple without hesitating. He sat down and he started eating the apple. Halfway through the apple, his hunger was satiated a bit and now his mind is clearing. He realizes, Allahu Akbar, I have committed a sin. I have committed a sin. Without the permission of the owner of this orchard, I plucked an apple and I am eating of it. It is haram upon me. Look at his taqwa. Today, at times, we don't even bother where our wealth is coming from. Whether it is, interest, whether it is an interest-based transaction, whether it is halal or haram, we don't care as long as the money comes. But look at him. Because of the taqwa, because of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even that half apple was troubling him now. And then he decides, I have to go and make this halal. I have to go and make this halal for me. So he asks around, he finds out that the owner of the particular orchard lived somewhere in another locality. He travels all the way to that locality. He goes to that man's house. And he knocks on the door. The owner of the orchard opens the door. Yes, what is it? He says, Uncle, I'm so and so. This is what happened. I'm a student of knowledge. I was very, very hungry. He tells the whole story. This man looks at him and frowns. So what do you want? The boy says, I want you to please grant me permission and make it halal for me. 
He says, no, I will not. I will settle this with you on the day of Qiyamah. I will not make it halal for you. The boy is upset. He's upset. He just sits down there. The man dashes the door and he goes inside. The boy sits there and he waits. This was after Salatul Dhuhr, if I'm not mistaken. He waits until Salatul Asr by the doorstep of the man. The man comes out to go to the masjid. He opens the door. He sees the boy seated there yet. He asks him, what do you want, boy? Why are you seated here? The boy says, uncle, I'm ready to do anything that you say to make this apple halal. I don't even mind working as a gardener in your garden or as a security for your garden. Just make it halal for me because I don't, I don't care about paying for it in this world. I don't want to pay for it in the fire of Jahannam. Allahu Akbar. Then the man says, okay. So, you're ready to do anything. I'm ready to do anything. Okay, I want you to marry my daughter. I want you to marry my daughter. The boy was a bit shocked. Marriage, it's a good thing and all that. So, it's not really tough. So, no strings attached. No, this is what, he, what was going on in his mind. So, he said, you know, he was thinking perhaps he had to perhaps, you know, be a farmer for about 10 years or 5 years or something like that, a marriage proposal. So he said, okay, I'm ready. But then the man says, but there's a small catch. My daughter, she is blind. Oh. My daughter, she's dumb, she's mute, she can't talk. My daughter, she's deaf, she can't hear. My daughter, she's disabled, she can't walk. Now the boy was devastated. He's a student of knowledge, was looking forward to a good marriage. Now if he were to enter into this marriage, he would have to shoulder the responsibility of looking after a patient. He will not be able to pursue in his career. He will not be able to seek knowledge. It will be a burden. But then at the back of his mind, he thinks, if that is the price I have to pay, to make this halal for me, so be it, come what may, I accept. He says, okay, fine, that's not a problem, I'm ready, I'm ready. Fine, good, mashallah, this is the date, it was in one week's time, you come to my house, I know you're not financially well off, so we'll talk about all of the, you know, the contract details when you come. The boy goes, one week flies, and unlike other grooms, when the day nears his heart is becoming heavier and heavier other grooms are waiting for to get married but now he is dreading the day as it gets closer the day dawns he drags himself with heavy steps to the man's house he knocks the door the man welcomes him in his to be son-in-law he welcomes him in the marriage is done and the man says you can enter the room of your bride. Other grooms will be excited at this moment. This boy is, his heart is so heavy, he feels like running away. But then this is the price to pay to make it halal. So be it, he goes and enters the room. He enters the room, he looks at the girl, the sight that greeted him, Allahu Akbar, it shocked him. She was a beautiful girl with long black hair cascading, no deformation at all, eyes were bright and beautiful, no disabilities, nothing. He was thinking, have I come into the wrong room perhaps? Then the girl, she recognizes the shock in his face, and then she, say, she says, I think I know why you are so surprised. Then he says, yes, because your father, he gave me a completely different picture about you. Then the girl asks him, so what did my father tell you about me? He said, that, he said that you are blind, he said that you're dumb, you're mute, he said that you're deaf, he said that you're disabled. She said, Wallahi, my father has spoken the truth. He said that I am blind because my eyes have not witnessed anything that is haram. He said that I am dumb, I am mute because I have never ever spoken an evil word. I have never ever uttered anything that would displease my maker. He said I am deaf 
Because I've never ever listened to any evil speech, be it gossip, be it music, be it anything haram. My ears are pure from all of that. He said, I'm disabled because I've never walked towards anything haram or walked to perpetrate any sin. Allahu Akbar. My father was looking high and low for a groom to suit me. And then you came about and he was blown away. He was impressed by your taqwa that you're willing to do anything to make that half apple halal. Allahu Akbar. And that is why he decided that you are the suitable spouse for me. And now we are in this bond of nikah. My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam. I mentioned this story. This is a story from our Salafuna Salih, our pious predecessors. This nikah was founded on what? Not on money, not on some transaction, not that I'm getting a BMW or not that I'm getting a house here or there. On taqwa. And you know, through that relationship, the child that was born to those two fortunate parents was none other than the great scholar who filled the earth with his knowledge, Al Imam Abu Hanifa. Nu'man ibn Thabit rahimahullah. So my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, it is important. The primary ingredient for a successful marriage is nothing other than taqwa. You bring in taqwa, your whole life is going to be successful. You adopt a life of taqwa, you will attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. But sadly, many of us today, we haven't fully understood the concept of nikah. We haven't fully understood what nikah is all about. And that is why we enter into the bond of nikah and we don't know how to secure the bond of nikah. We, for petty small issues, we tend to throw the bond of nikah out of the window by resorting to divorce. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. All of us want to secure our marriages. All of us want to be the best of husbands. All of us want to do that. If you were to talk to the sisters, they want to be the best of wives. But how do we do that? We need to derive lessons from the best of mankind, from the best role model, from the best husband ever, from the best teacher, our beloved master, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And please remember salawat whenever I mention his beautiful name. Hadith is in Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم is reported to have said that the best from amongst y'all is the best is the one who is best towards his family and I am the best from amongst y'all towards my own family he was the best husband ever so it is upon us to derive lessons from his life and apply it into our lives if we wish to secure our marriages. So, this evening let us look at a few solutions towards securing the magical bond of marriage. Because shaitan is all out to break beautiful bonds of marriage. Shaitan just loves to do it. Hadith is in Muslim. The hadith goes along the lines of these words where shaitan has put up his throne on water and he sends out his armies to cause mischief and corruption on the face of this earth. He sends out his armies and every day he listens to their reports, what they have to say. Each of these armies, they come back and they say, you know, we did this, we did that. He listens. Okay, okay, okay. Until finally one of them comes and says, I saw two individuals, husband and wife, the narration goes along the lines of these words. I did not leave them until I drove a wedge in between them, until I separated them. He happily looks at him and says, you are the one. He praises that devil and he says, you are the one. You have done the best. Hadith is in Muslim. 
Why, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam? Because nikah, this bond of marriage, it is the foundation, it is the institution towards a great society. Broken homes lead to broken children who in return make up a broken society. But on the other hand, a good bond of marriage will result in a good home, resulting in good children who will become the leaders of tomorrow. So shaitan knows that. Shaitan is clever. Shaitan is cunning. He is our sworn enemy. And he is not hasty. He uses different strategies to break us. So it is upon us to be two times clever than him. And we need to identify his traps and not fall into his traps. So let us move on to the few solutions that I wish to share with you all. Number one, be happy with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, sadly, many of us, we find it difficult to accept our lives because we are not happy with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for us. Let me ask you all a question. See, some of us, look at our complexions. Some of us are very fair. Some of us are brown. Some of us are dark. This is what Allah the Almighty has decreed for us. Now, can any one of us get up in the morning and go to the mirror and say, you know what, I'm too white. I want to scratch my face away. We, do we do that? No, we are happy with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for us because that cannot be changed. We don't have a choice in regard to it. Likewise, everything in our lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed it. And it is upon us to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because after all, this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is a very, very short life. Can any one of us, you and I, can we guarantee that we will leave this masjid? What is the time now? Okay, perhaps it's 8.45. If... It's 8.37. If Malakul Maut, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that this individual is to pass away at sharp 9 o'clock p.m., can you or can I stop Malakul Maut from coming? Will he listen to us? Will we be even, will a second be given to us in extra? If it's 9 o'clock, it's going to be on the dot. Malakul Maut will be there. The question that you and I, we need to ask ourselves, are we ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ready to meet our maker? For there is no delaying Malakul Maut. He will come at the appointed time. It is a very short life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And there is no point in latching ourselves to this worldly life because it's going to go like this. Maybe you're 20 years of age, 40, 60. The max they will live these days is 60, 70. It flies like this. And then we are moving from this temporary world to the perpetual, eternal life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in store for us. So do you think, what is worthwhile? Investing in this life or investing for the akhirah that is going to be eternal and permanent? It is upon us to make proper investments for the Akhirah where we will enjoy eternally forever and ever. So number one, be happy with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keeping in mind that even the pleasures of this dunya, this dunya they, they are also short-lived. The hardships and the trials of this dunya are also short-lived. Nothing is permanent. Everything, everything is transitory and temporary. This is solution number one. Solution number two, in regard to the cycle between mawadda and rahma, and this is why I did not translate these two words at the beginning when I recited the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa taala He says, "Wajalla bayna kum mawadda wa rahma." If you're talking about two spouses in a marriage, Allah subhanahu wa taala has placed in between them mawadda and rahma. Allah has placed these two elements in a marriage. Now, what is mawadda and what is rahma? They are not the same thing. Mawadda can be translated as compassionate love. Compassionate love. Rahma, on the other hand, I think all of you all know that, is mercy. So why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His infinite wisdom, used these two words? Scholars of Tafasir, they mention that in a marriage, what happens is, 
normally, say at the outset of a marriage, at the very inception or the beginning of a marriage, everything is rosy. Everything is rosy. There's so much of bubbly, hot, young love and perhaps the husband is doing wonderful things for the wife and the wife is doing exactly the same thing to the husband. Everything is nice. Oh, and then we'll touch on honeymoons also. And then they go on a honeymoon and everything is so nice. But then if you were to take it down the line, four or five years later on, say one or two pregnancies later, or perhaps after a few arguments, which, is, which are generally inevitable in a, in, a, in, a, in a relationship, what happens is perhaps the levels of love may drop a bit. Now, does that mean, oh, the, love, the levels of love have dropped now? Let me just chuck the marriage out of the, mari uh, out of the window. Let me resort to divorce. Is that the solution? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brings about a cycle. The minute the levels of love start depleting, mercy has to come in place. And recharge the levels of love 100% again. Say if the levels of love start dropping, the husband has to look at the wife, oh, she is the one who bore me so many children. She went through so many pregnancies with all of those hardships. She is the one who washes my clothes, cooks food for me, looks after my house, cleans my house. Even though all of these things are not her responsibilities, we need to put a maid and get it done. But then she does it out of her own good nature. This is my wife. She is the mother of my children. The Rahma needs to come in and charge the levels of love 100% again. The wife needs to look at the husband. Every single day he goes out. He is the breadwinner. He slaves from morning to evening, earning for us, for the family, paying for the children's tuition, school fees. He, he places food on the table. He goes through so much of hardships. For what? For our family. He travels all over the world for the sake of business. For what? To provide for us. This has to come in and recharge the levels of love back again 100%. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought in وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً The scholars of Tafasir they mention. So from this rahmah, this cycle between mawadda and rahmah, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, is that we need to constantly reassure our spouses in regard to love. You see, we men, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, we are logical creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created women as emotional creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you were to take a problem for instance we men we want to break down the problem then and there put everything on the table discuss it like how men do this is what we do because we think logically but on the other hand women they take the more emotional side let me explain like in regard to art train of thoughts, the way we think, we men, you see, say for example, we have a problem at work, we have a problem, if we face a problem at work, when we come home, it is very easy for us to shut the problem out of the door and enter home with a completely happy face. We can do that. It's called compartmentalizing. We can push that thought into one room in our brains and shut it and focus on something else. Say we have a problem at home, may Allah save us, we can go to work and act normal, we can be normal with our friends. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us men. And likewise, there's a downside to it too. We cannot multitask. We cannot multitask. We want to focus on one thing, get it done, move to the other thing. That's how we work. Let me give you an example. If you're at work, can you type a document on Word or pages whilst you are working on a spreadsheet on Excel or numbers, whilst you are responding to your customers' emails and also watching a video on YouTube and posting statuses on Facebook? Is it possible? Can we men do it? Maybe with the new range of Samsung Galaxies and all that, they have the multitasking window, maybe possible. But in general, we men, we can't do it. But look at women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them in such a way that they can multitask. Let me give you an example. In the morning, you're getting ready for work. 
your wife your wife she will prepare breakfast for you she will prepare the breakfast for the children she will get the children ready for school whilst also thinking about the marketing list she will also help you get ready by perhaps giving your clothes ironing your clothes keeping your shoes doing all of that sending the uh, to school sending you off to work whilst already she would have halfway cooked lunch also you see they can multitask this is how women think so likewise when we come to problems now we can't multitask so if a an issue breaks up an argument in general say whatever the argument may be we want to sort out that argument and finish it off then and there but women from one argument they'll jump to another argument and then another argument and we'll be wondering from where is all of this coming from and remember women never forget anything women they never forget anything good memories mashallah i'm praising them they never forget anything so they will jump from point A to point B to point C. You will be flabbergasted. We wonder from where is all of this coming from. But this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created men and women. And it is upon us to identify how women think and behave accordingly if we wish to secure our marriages. The next solution, my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, is in regard to gestures of love. We have verbal gestures of love and physical gestures of love. Because sometimes these things start to lack in a relationship, resulting in the relationship becoming stale, in the love becoming stale, in the levels of love dropping perhaps. The minute we do these things, and these are from the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam. once we start doing it, it, it adds a bit of spice into the relationship and it spices up the marriage mashallah so from these verbal gestures of love and romance you should reassure your spouses by saying by professing your love often at the very inception of the marriage there's always i love you is going back and forth but gradually as it starts getting stale i love you is completely forgotten i'm just asking you when was the last time you told your wife i love you it gradually becomes stale. I love you, whether it be in any language, it never goes out of style. And the minute you say that, you see her blushing red. Even now, even tonight, if you were to go and try it, you just say, I love you, she's going to blush red. It works wonders. So it is upon us to verbally profess our love and our care for our wives. And also, it is upon us to address them using sweet names. See, at times, I don't know how it's here, but in our country, they address using pronouns like he or she in our language okay they will never address directly or he went she went that's how they address their spouses but look at the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to address our beloved mother aisha radiyallahu anha ya humaira he used to address her ya humaira now humaira was not her name her name was Aisha radiallahu anha but he used to very fondly and very lovingly address her as Ya Humaira Humaira means O oh, rosy cheeked one Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the greatest prophet ever with all of his responsibilities with all of his duties at times we say we are busy we don't have time are you a prophet? are you busier than the prophet also? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had time to be intimate with his beloved wives. He used to call Aisha radiallahu anha, Ya Humaira, O rosy cheeked one. So what is stopping us from calling our wives honey, sweetheart, cupcake, sugar, all of these words. It spices the relationship. It is from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you look at where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call his wife using affectionate names. Likewise, we should also address our spouses using affectionate names. It works wonders, mashallah. And also from verbal gestures, we should compliment them. At the very inception, oh, you're wearing a nice dress today. Gradually as it goes, yeah, yeah, it's nice, it's nice. It becomes that don't care attitude. At the beginning when she cooks a nice dish for you, it's superb but then gradually oh the salt is not enough this is not enough there's always finding faults that also results in a downside in a relationship 
So we should always compliment them for the dress that they wear, for the food that they make for us. For different things, we should compliment our spouses because that also secures a beautiful marriage. And also we should appreciate whatever they do for us. At times, we go out of the way to appreciate what strangers do for us. But then we forget the spouse who is by our side. And whatever I am saying is also applicable to the sisters, if they are listening. It has to work. Marriage is a two-way street. It is not a one-way street. You give and you take. That's how it works. Marriage is a two-way street. You have to give if you wish to take. That's how it works. So we should also appreciate. Now from the physical gestures of love and romance, the occasional gifts. Don't restrict gifts to Valentine's Day, birthdays, because primarily scholars are unanimous in regard to Valentine's Day that it is not upon us to celebrate Valentine's Day. It is from pagan cultures. In regard to birthdays, it is not upon us to celebrate anyone's birthday. It is not upon us to celebrate anyone's birthday because birthdays are not from Islam. It is not from the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But rather the occasional gifts, there is no harm. Anytime just randomly you can take a gift and go. Even tonight perhaps you could buy something and go for your spouses because hadith is in, hadith is in Adab al-Mufrad of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Tahadaw tahabu. Give gifts to one another, the levels of love will increase. You will start loving one another. It's not only applicable for spouses, even between friends. If you give gifts to one another, the love between you will increase. Words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam al-Albani rahimahullah has classed it as Hassan. Also from the physical gestures of uh, love, that you make time for one another. Like I said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made time. Why can't we make time? We should make time for one another, quality time. We need to spend quality time with one another. Because women, they want as much as emotional security as they can get. A survey was done. 90% of women in that survey, they opted for a secure relationship with a poor man who is ready to spend more time with them over an insecure relationship with a rich man who is not going to spend time with them. Doesn't count. Wealth is not what counts. They want you to spend time with them. So it is upon us to make time. Because it's always perhaps hanging out with your friends or you're at work, you finish work and you come, perhaps you're headed to the gym or you're hanging out with your friends. You don't make time for your spouse, that's going to result in negative effects in your relationship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. Can I ask all of you a question? When was the last time or have you ever rested on the lap of your spouse? Have you ever placed your head on the lap of your spouse? Or when was the last time that you placed your head on the lap of your spouse? Hadith is in Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recline on the lap of our beloved mother Aisha radiallahu anha even in the state when she used to be menstruating. Even when she was in her menses, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to lie down on her lap. Allahu Akbar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would also recite Quran whilst reclining on the lap of Aisha radiallahu anha. Look at the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the quality time he spent with his wives. These are all beautiful teachings from our beloved master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another beautiful physical gesture from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadith is in Muslim under the chapter Kitabul Hayr. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the narration goes along the lines of these words. Whenever she used to take a cup of drink whatever it may be water when he when she used to drink rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to take the cup from her after she drank search for where her lips had been placed on the cup and then place his lips on the same place and drink from there allahu akbar have you done this and also when she used to eat meat say if a chicken or whatever it may be, he used to, while she was eating halfway, he will take that piece from her 
and bite from the same place that she had bit from. Look at the love. Allahu Akbar. These are lessons that we need to learn. This builds love between the two spouses. This is our master, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of husbands. Because my dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, actions speak louder than words. And remember, the beautiful moments of today are the beautiful memories of tomorrow. The beautiful moments of today are the beautiful memories of tomorrow. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many narrations where he used to kiss his wives often. At times there are some of us who have, they don't know when was the last time they kissed their wives. Allahu Akbar. Whenever he used to leave home, he used to kiss his wife. Even there is a narration where Rasulullah used to kiss his wives even whilst he was fasting. Just to show his love. Allahu Akbar. And then from the physical gestures also is to dress up for your spouses. At the very beginning of a marriage, everybody is prim and you know, smart. But then gradually as it goes, my God, you can't look at them. That's not the way. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, As my wife adorns herself for me, I adorn myself for her. At times we have pot bellies and we have not taken a shower and all of these things, but we expect our wives to be like actresses. But then what about us? We need to adorn ourselves just as how they adorn themselves for us, so that we'll also look handsome. Look appealing to them. This is also something that secures a beautiful relationship. And in regard to recreational activities with your spouses, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we all of us, I'm sure, are aware of the narration, where he used to race. He used to find time to race with his wife. There's a narration where he challenged Aisha radiallahu anha, and the first time Aisha radiallahu anha won, because that was at the, when she was young and she was thin at that time. And the second time, Rasulullah was waiting for the opportunity. After some time, he challenged her again. And he won the second time because she had put on some weight. So Rasulullah was observing that. Okay, this time I will beat her. And then he challenged her and there was a race. Rasulullah the prophet to the entire mankind and jinn kind, with all of his responsibilities, with all of what he did, he was a military leader, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was all of that, and he had time to be the best husband. Allahu Akbar. My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, marriage is not only love. Please don't be fooled by that. Marriage is not only love, because there are some people who think that marriage is only love, and they enter the relationship, and the minute the levels of love drop, they are disappointed. Remember that marriage is a lifelong relationship that entails love, care, mercy, compromise, understanding, adjustments, consideration. All of this is applicable in terms of a marriage. We need to be able to make a little adjustment. We need to be able to uh, be understanding in regard to our spouses. All of this summed up is what brings about a beautiful marriage. I wrap off the talk by touching on one more final topic, and that is in regard to communication between two spouses. In regard to the communication. At times, there's just silence between the two spouses. Or, even if there is communication, they don't know how to communicate. Like I said in the beginning, arguments are inevitable. Married people in the crowd will affirm or attest to that. Arguments are inevitable. And at times, tiny things blow out of proportion and become a big issue. Thunderstorms are brewn in teacups. Tiny issues. Oh, why did you keep the towel like that? Just something like that at the wrong moment might trigger a huge argument. So we have to remember that if ever an argument comes up, one of the two parties, one of the two spouses have to be calm. If you think that your wife is angry at this moment, it is upon you to be calm at that moment. If you are angry, it is upon your spouse, your wife, 
The sister, she has to understand that she better be calm at this moment. If both start yelling at one another, the house may go up in flames. So it is upon us to be very careful in our communication. And also don't ever hesitate to say sorry. Even if you are right, because the minute you say, sorry is a magical word. The minute you say sorry, it patches up everything. But spouses find it very difficult to get down from their high horse and apologize, to say sorry. And that is what results at times in, in two spouses growing, uh, b b distancing themselves from one another. There was once a lady who had a husband who had a very hot temper. She, he had a very hot temper. He used to flare up for every little thing. And he used to bark at her, shout at her, scold her. But she loved him a lot. This is a story which has a moral to it. And that's why I'm telling you. So she loved him, but he used to find fault with her, get angry all the time, bark at him. She was finding life very difficult, but she loved him sincerely. And she wanted him to love her the same way. But she was finding it very difficult because arguments, everyday arguments, fighting, 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 fighting. Because naturally, severe fights, you know, add to the stress of a relationship, you know, gradually it might break. So she was worried about that. And she found out that there is this lady who practices magic. Who practices magic. She goes to that lady and she tells her, I want a love portion. You know a love portion? I want you to make a love portion where I'll put it into the food of my husband. The minute he eats it, he'll be madly in love with me. And then there'll be no more arguments. I want to solve the issue. Quick, shortcut. This lady, who was an old lady, she told her, okay, fine. But you know, this love portion is a very difficult portion to make. I need to brew it. I need very special ingredients. I will find the other herbs and all of that stuff. But there's one main ingredient which the wife say in a relationship if you want your husband to love you if you want the love portion you must go and get that ingredient what is that three whiskers from a tiger three whiskers from a tiger and she told this lady there is a tiger in this jungle you get the whiskers and come i'll make you the portion and i'll give you and your husband will be madly in love with you now this lady was at an utter loss. How am I to get three whiskers from a tiger? The tiger might eat me alive. She goes home and she contemplates, she thinks, how am I to do it? And then she's like, okay, let me at least go and see this tiger. The next day morning, she gets up, she readies herself. When she's about to leave home, when she's about to leave home, she's petrified. She gives up the idea, I, I, I cannot do it. I cannot go and meet a tiger. And she leaves the idea. It took about a month or two when finally she decided, okay, I'm going to go to the jungle and see what this tiger is all about. And she goes to the jungle. She goes to the jungle by the cave where the tiger was. And then she's at the entrance of the cave. The tiger rose and she runs away. She runs away. And now this took about another few months for her to get used to that. And gradually she started feeding food to the tiger, throwing the food. And after about a year or two, she tamed, she tamed the tiger to such an extent that she could go close to the tiger and give the food. Now she was gradually taming the tiger, slowly, 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 until it became so much to the extent that now she could pat the tiger. She could pat the tiger and feed the food to the tiger. But now still she's scared to pluck the whiskers because it'll hurt the tiger and she's worried that the tiger might do something if that's the case. So she still waited patiently patting the tiger until one fine day she plucked up her courage and she plucked the whiskers. And then not all, at, not all at once, one whisker a day. One whisker a day, she plucked all three whiskers of the tiger and then she very proudly takes it to this lady and she, she says, I've got your ingredient after so much of hardship, now make me the potion and give me. The old lady says, you tamed a wild tiger and got three whiskers. I don't think it's difficult for you to now go and tame your angry husband. <laughs> so no portion involved, just patience and being quiet in terms of arguments, you will be able to tame your husband.
this is actually for the sisters. But anyway, like I said, marriage is a two-way street and it's also applicable for us too. That when we are in an argument, be quiet. Don't go to say anything. You say something, that's where things are blown out of proportion. And always resort to apologizing, it makes things a whole lot easier. So with that, we conclude today's talk. I wish to thank all of you all for making time and coming here. Jazakumullahu khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you all. May Allah the Almighty reward all of us. And may He forgive all of our sins and may He accept our good deeds. And may He, the Almighty, unite us in the gardens of Jannah just as how He united us here tonight with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever correct said was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the perfect. And if there was anything wrong in what I said, it is from me and from shaitan. And I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness in regard to that. Uh, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanakallah wa bihamdik, Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfirka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakumullahu khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.